Welcome. My name is Dr. Brian Allen. Uh, I have a doctorate in business administration, and I currently work at uh, National University in the School of Health Professions, where I'm the Associate Dean of Faculty. I'd also like to welcome my co-presenter, Dr. Marie Bukhari. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marie Bukhari. I am currently faculty in the School of Business and Economics, where I lead the MBA program. I have a DBA in business management, as well as an EDD in education leadership. Dr. Allen. Awesome. Thank you for joining us today. This is the beginning, uh, the first part of three of um, developing yourself into a doctoral learner, creating for yourself that doctoral mindset. Uh, in this series, uh, you will have the opportunity to go through and, and and we will describe some of the things that will help you to develop your skill sets um, to kind of create the particular focus that you need to be successful in your doctoral journey. So on that note, let's start with the most important thing. And that's kind of the educational path and expectations. So to do this, what I think uh, we really need to do is we need to start backwards. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with your elementary education. So in your elementary education, uh, you were taught um, the ones, twos, and threes, the, um, you know, see, see cat run uh, or see the dog run, see dog catch ball, those kinds of things. They were very basic rules, and they were rudimentary rules that were foundational to your understanding of the world around you. Um, if you take that into middle school and high school, you are create you are taught the rules, right? The rules of arithmetic, the rules of writing, Um those rules are important because they're the foundation upon which education allows you to, to create um, the cognitive skills to, to solve real world problems. Okay. And, and guess what? Throughout your education, those are going to be fundamental. So you're created, uh, you created in, in your, in your early education, the foundation of, well, and we're going to solve this. We're going to, um, discuss this in the actual way that it probably works for most of us. And that is in grade school, you learned the basics. You repeated um, what you knew, um, you took tests, and quite frankly, most of us kind of flushed it, right? Summer vacation came along and you flushed that material. And then the next year you had to have some rudimentary um, uh, follow-up and you learned those skills again. And then you, you developed a uh, or added additional skills to that skill set. So first grade, all the way up into high school. Well, guess what? When you got into high school, if you were lucky and, and you had the talent, guess what? You might've been in some AP classes and you got an opportunity to develop some of the skill sets that would be needed when you got to the college level. Well, in the college level, in the undergraduate level, um, you added to those foundational skills that you had from your, um, from your elementary and high school education. Um, and those, but functionally, those skills were focused on creating the general education courses that you needed, right? So they were foundational to the other things that you were going to learn to have a specialization. So let's say that that you got a degree in accounting, you learned the basics of accounting, and you learned the principles uh, therein, or or it was nursing, and you learned those foundational skills in nursing, or whatever the case may be. Those domains became the found uh, they were foundational in what you were doing um, at the undergraduate level. When you got to the master's level, the expectation is that you are going to um, become a master of your domain. Thus, it is a master's degree. Well, those were all still foundational because they were all based on this idea that here are the rules, here's uh, the standards, here are the expectations, and they were just enlarged expectations and understanding of those expectations. When you get to the doctoral level, not only are you expected to have those foundational understanding, but sometimes you're expected to really throw them out the window and to really think about things in a context and a, and a framework that you had never thought about it before. And, and you begin to say, well, maybe one plus two isn't three. Maybe there are some, some X's and some Y's and some algebraic equations in this process. Or well, what, happen, what would happen if I, if I took a business idea and a business problem and I applied some biological 
studies, right? Some biology studies or, or some principles from those different domains and disciplines to solve some of those real world business problems or whatever the, your specialization may be. And so that you, what you tried to do is use, apply a scientific method of inquiry to solve real world problems. That's what doctors do. And, and as you start down this doctoral uh, path and this doctoral journey, your goal is to take all of those foundational things you learned all the way up to this point and get rid of the mindset of learn, test, and flush, and learn, test, apply, turn it on its ear, reapply different principles. And so that's the mindset that you need to start your doctoral journey with. Um, I'm going to stop there because I have all sorts of ways to look at this. Maybe it's putting on a different pair of glasses, whatever the case may be. Uh, Marie, what would you add to that? You know, as you're, as you're explaining the whole process of learning from uh, our first time in kindergarten all the way through to the doctoral level, the one thing that comes to mind and kind of sticks there is that you transform throughout your years of exposure to um, to learning, to uh, materials, um, and, and you end up refining your area of interest and you find somewhere along in there, you find your passion. What are you passionate about? Now we're asking you to take that passion and turn it into a meaningful research project um, that you will use to put your stamp on the world and say, hey, I did the research in this and I became the expert. Uh, We'll go more into that and how you're going to actually build that. But remember this as a transformation, not just transitioning from, you know, grade school to middle school, high school, college. All righty. Dr. Allen, let's take this uh, one step further. I know you've got um, some real keen insights here. Uh, well, what I have is a sense of humor. At least I think it is a sense of humor. That's what I'm telling myself. So, um, you know, in learning, one of the things that we have to think about is what's your trajectory of learning? How do you link disassociative parts and ideas to to real world problems? Now, I, I need to talk a little bit about something um, that starts in this process. And, and so let's start, let's take these kind of in steps. The first is this fear and anxiety. Oh no, I don't know if I can do this. Well, you don't know what you don't know until you try, right? And so one of the things that I, that, that I want you to understand is, is um, there's some great advice here, right? And, and I found two quotes that I love. Now, one of them is a fictional character, but I love it, right? It's a um, you've seen you've seen the movies most likely, and Ch- Captain Jack Sparrow says the problem is not the problem. The problem is your attitude about the problem. Do you understand? And I think the context here is that, quite frankly, sometimes we we're so concerned about this big picture of this doctoral journey that we don't understand that it's all really about incremental steps. So take your fear, use it as a as a, a tool for your success. Right. And so that's the way I treated it throughout um, my coursework in at at master's level, at the doctoral level is my fear of, quite frankly, failure or sometimes my fear of success had to be turned into a tool for empowerment. And so one of the things I had to tell myself and remind myself many times was it's okay if I if I fail at this there's not a whole lot of people that are at this level and it's okay. I may just have to pick myself up and start again. And so don't be afraid that there might be some failure points along the way. That anxiety is normal, but use it as your your tool of empowerment. If you use it as your tool of empowerment, guess what? You will find that you can be successful. Now, I love this Will Rogers quote. It says, I know worrying works because none of the stuff I worried about ever happened. And that's, I think, critical to this understanding of how to empower yourself through understanding what your fears and your your anxieties are. Because as you understand that those fears and anxieties are normal, the reality is many of the things that you think 
are likely to happen probably won't because there are there are all sorts of systems to support students through this doctoral students through this process and as we go through the rest of this pre of these presentations we're really going to talk about how you create this self empowered self managed directive learning that allows you to be successful and so think about each of those things as an opportunity for you to say I may have fear, but fear is going to motivate me to take the next step and to say, okay, well, how do I get to what I want to research? How do I get to where I need to be? And and how do I get to be the expert that I need to be? And, and we're going to talk about that uh, later on. Now, the one thing that I I think many people fail at is they fail to develop muscle uh, memory, uh, let's try this, decision-making muscles. And and of all the things that I think have the capacity to um, disarm and to cause folks to truly fail to succeed is they fail to make decisions. And by definition, that is a decision. Failing to make a decision does give you some outcome. It just may not be the one you want. And so you're going to have to, through the context of your journey you're, and through the process of your journey, you're going to have to say, the problem is not what I think the problem is. The problem may be my attitude about the problem and how am I going to address that? How am I going to empower myself to be successful no matter the circumstances? And, and let's face it, there's going to be some challenges along the way and we'll talk about those. And some of those are, are, are well, they're going to be ones that you're going to have to you're going to have to decide am i going to ad address this problem now or am i going to address it later and focus on the things that are going to allow me to succeed in my education now all of those things i say with one real important caveat you still have to have a life and it is really easy as researchers, as students, it's really easy to get wrapped up into this is the most important thing in my life. Well, guess what? If, if I don't get to enjoy it, the success at the end with the people that I care about, I don't think that's really success. Now, that's my own personal opinion, and you may differ, um, but you're probably wrong. No, I'm just joking. Um, you, so you just need to think about that. So your success needs to be something that you can share with people at the end. But don't worry about the things that could, might, could sort of maybe possibly happen. Um, worry about the things that you can control. And if there are things that, that are out of your control, that's okay. Let them be out of your control. And if you allow that to work, guess what? You can find the linkage to identified problems. You can align your, your efforts and, and your responsibilities around the elements of your life that will allow you to be successful in this journey. All right. I've talked a lot. Marie, what would you like to add there? All right. So you, you mentioned fear. Um, one of the challenges with fear is that it makes us do one of two things. We either freeze right where we are or we hightail it and get out of town, right? Uh, the thing is, as Dr. Allen was sharing here, you have to let fear be a motivator. Let that be the thing that drives you to do something. Um, as I work with students on a regular basis, the one thing I tell them is there is no time to sit and wait. You know, uh, folks get to a point where their document is going through review. Well, you know, that is not the time to sit down and do nothing and just twiddle your thumbs and wait for it to come back. There's always something that you can work forward to. So as we, you know, we're, students are always fearful of what's going to come back from that review as well. But if you continue working toward your ultimate goal, um, regardless of what comes back, you're actually going to be prepared to deal with it. You have a support system in this process. It is your, it, your committee members. It is uh, uh, the valuable resources that your university provides. But the one thing we don't want you to do is freeze. Because if you freeze, guess what? Nothing happens. But 
if we stay in motion and we develop that perpetual motion that we often hear about in physics, it will carry you through to the end. So Dr. Allen, I'm going to uh, continue here by talking a little bit about feedback today. Um, I mentioned it a couple seconds ago about what are we gonna hear back from our committee, right? Um, there are a lot of truths about feedback. And I'm not only going to talk to you about um, the feedback itself and what to do with it, I'm also going to tell you what not to do with it. Okay. So <clears throat> feedback is really a gift. Okay. We, um, we oftentimes will hear things that we don't really want to hear um, or you know, our, our faculty, our committee members are telling us things that actually may seem like more work. But remember this, you're, you're striving to get into a space in life where few people are. And it takes work, it takes determination, but it also takes a lot of humility. So when you receive that feedback, one of the things that I like to tell my students is, hey, you know, you got feedback, read through it, put it aside, go do something else, go do some laundry, make dinner, um, go off or run. The reason I suggest this is because while you're doing all of those things, your mind is still working and reflecting back on that feedback. So you're kind of sorting it out as you go. A lot of this will happen unconsciously, but I will tell you, when you go back and you look at that feedback once again, it is not going to raise near the emotion that it did the first time you read it. You're definitely going to understand it more deeply. And you will actually be prepared to act on it. Um, you will you will have absorbed it to the point where it's like, oh, I see what they're talking about. Certainly I can do that. Normally when you get feedback, the fixes are small, but when you first see it, you see a whole sea of red on your paper or um, you see all these comment balloons on every other sentence. Remember, be humble about it, step away from it. And when you come back, your attitude toward it will be different your understanding of it will be different and you will be able to act on that feedback in such a way that it continues you on that path forward. Keep in mind, your committee is not there to challenge you or to stop you or to prevent you from uh, realizing your journey. They're there to help. And this feedback is in the best interest of you as a person. Dr. Allen, what do you have to add to that? You know, the I think the most important thing that I can add here, one, I would echo all of those things, but let me uh, focus on just two things. The, the first is that any feedback is not about you personally, but let's face it, not all of our ideas, well, okay, mine are, no, wait a minute, not all of our ideas are perfect right? Um, the reality is sometimes we have less than perfect ideation and, and we, we transfer those ideas, those understandings to paper in a way that maybe not, may not be coherent. And so if you think about the terms of what you write, how you write it, what are you doing um, if you take the feedback and automatically assume this is about me. They're saying this about me. And so that that overpersonalization, that highly emotional response is is out is actually counterintuitive to your success. So if there are if there the first thing that I would say is never personalize feedback. It is okay if your idea is wrong. It is okay if you expressed the idea in an errant fashion. That's okay. Be willing to accept that you may not know everything you think that you know. And, and be willing to accept that someone may know a little bit more than you. In fact, you want them to know more than you. That's why they're your committee 
chair and subject matter expert and other committee members, they're there for the purpose of helping you to, to express in a meaningful way those ideas and your interpretation of those ideas as coherent, as meaningful, as solid scientific analysis, that, that you're creating logical connections that fit together and they fit together logically. Now, that doesn't mean that there can't be disparate ideas, which we talked about earlier, right? Sometimes it's the, it's the, this disparate idea with this disparate idea where no one ever has ever looked at it and you bring it together and guess what? You create, you create a cohesion of those ideas and a different way, a different lens to look at that problem. Those are okay. But if someone says, you know what, that's been tried before and here's where the failure points are in that, be willing to accept that they're giving you sound advice. It doesn't mean that you can't challenge it, but never take it personal. So first, don't personalize the feedback and don't be emotional about it, right? It is not about being emotional. If you are emotional about the feedback, that's a negative output for you and you don't want that because that will de-incentivize you to be successful. And that is the very last thing your committee wants you to be. So thanks. Hey, no problem. Big message there. Don't get in your own way. So uh, we want to close today with um, where we began, actually, with the doctoral mindset. And really what you have to look forward to is being bold, being brave. Uh, we talked about uh, a few moments ago, we talked about how we accept feedback. Um, it's not always in the best light, but, you know, sometimes there is room to challenge that feedback. So you have to be bold enough and smart enough to say, hey, you know what? I don't know everything. So help me understand. Because a lot of times what it is, is that your committee, they have a different way of looking at something and they may want to guide you down that path but you may not understand it because of the way that maybe perhaps the way it's phrased or that you, you've been going through with these blinders on and you, you're not necessarily seeing the forest or the trees. So be, be uh, positive about this and make sure that you reach out and ask about those things that you don't understand. Remember, your committee is not here to solve your problems for you. They're not going to write your dissertation for you but they are there as guides. One of the analogies that I use with my students all the time is that, remember before we had uh, GPS, we used to use maps. Um, we would chart out our path before we got on the road. We'd write down our little list of instructions, tape it to the dashboard, but now we have GPS. Um, and while that may seem to make things easier, um, it, it just makes things different. We get directions as we go along. But when you're working on a dissertation, you are in that driver's seat. So how fast you go, you're, you're in charge of the brake pedal and the gas pedal. You're in charge of the steering wheel. Your committee is in the back seat and they have the GPS and they can give you the guidance to help you get where you're going to get to that um, final dissertation, to get to that oral defense. But remember, who's got charge of how fast, uh, how fast the vehicle goes? Who's got charge of whether you take a left turn at Albuquerque or not? Just remember, you're getting the guidance that you need. You will be on the right track, but it's a voyage of discovery all the way to the very end and even beyond. We are always discovering new things. And this is what research is about. This is what you are to become. You are to become a researcher. So be open to that voyage, be open to the experience, um, be determined, be focused. But remember at the end of the day, the effort that you put forward is the effort that's going to get you there. Dr. Allen, any final thoughts? For the, for, 
Oh, I have one, and I think it's one that that um, we miss quite often. It is you need to be a domain expert. To have a growth mindset as a student, you really need to be a domain expert. And let me explain what a domain is. It's it, in, in the simplest terms, it is your area of study, your area of inquiry. So let's, uh, let's assume you're a business student, but your area of inquiry is in project management, right? That's your domain is in project management. You need to be a domain expert. Well, how do you become a domain expert? Well, there are a lot of, pers- lot of different ideas, but the one that I, I think probably has the most value, at least from what I've seen, um, and who knows, I may be wrong, but I don't think I am. Well, not today, at least. No, um, is the, the supposition is it takes about 10,000 hours to be a subject matter expert. Now, think about this from a growth mindset. If you as a student, if you're coming in and you're going, hmm, I really want to study X or Y or Z, the first question you have to say is, well, what am I missing? What don't I know? Do I not know the terminology? Do I know the mindset? Do I not know the foundational works that have taken place, the seminal works that are that are critical to, to this analysis? So you have to know, what am I missing, right? Am I on the right track? Do I know where, where there are pieces missing? If I don't know where there are pieces missing, am I willing to go out of my way to find the experts that can support me so that I can know where I have those gaps, right? And as you know where those gaps are, guess what? Then you can say, hmm, I need to, I need to think about what I need to do to study more about that. So, so being a subject matter expert relative to your domain or a domain expert is critical. And I'll ask this question, if you're thinking about a growth mindset for you as a doctoral student, where are you willing to spend your time to become a domain expert? Are you willing to read 10,000 pages of literature? Are you willing to spend hours and hours developing your writing skills, developing your critical thinking skills, assessing where your logic may, may deviate from reality? So those are all things that you need to think about. And then you need to strategize how you are going to address those deficiencies. And it's okay. We all have them. But you need to recognize what those, what they are, work on those deficiencies, and overcome them. Now, you may not overcome them completely. You may, you may struggle with statistics to the very end of your dissertation. But if you work with experts who can help you, guess what? you have created the growth mindset and the action that follows that growth mindset to be successful. And that's what I would wrap up for this, our first part of our presentation. Thank you so much for joining us for this part of our presentation. We hope that you will join us for the second part. And um, we hope that we will give you the tools and the ideas that you can be successful in your doctoral journey. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay.